one culture telling one culture to the other is the more responsibility. Over here, you're giving them the rights to have this. More than that. Here. Well, not just responsibility. What we have done is we have basically cut a deal with the poor. We said starting in the late 1960s, we'll maintain you. We'll send you money. Now, being selfish middle class people, we never send enough money. But the theory was we'll send money. We won't demand you change your behavior. You want to have your kids born in total ignorance? Hey, that would be inappropriate for us to interfere. You want to go to a local school that doesn't work? Well, at least it's not a school we send our kids to. So we'll give lip service to changing it, but the truth is we won't change it. We'll just have study commissions that'll say, yes, they should do better. And the result is, what you have allowed to happen over 30, what we have all allowed to happen over a 30 year period, is these people don't have their, they do not have what the Declaration of Independence guarantees them. Now to do that, you've got to, for example, reestablish safety. Any American who's physically threatened is being cheated of the constitutional provision to provide for the common security. Because danger can be domestic as well as foreign. I mean, I, I swear to uphold the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, if it's a person walking into your room to kill you, whether that person's wearing a foreign uniform or blue jeans, your rights as an American are about to be exterminated. So you have to start with the idea, are we prepared to protect you physically? How much are we prepared to protect you physically? When you're born. Do we want to encourage a system where you actually have, where, where your mother has a sense of responsibility? There you're right. There you start getting into responsibility. But do we also want to figure out some way to make sure that health care is nearby if your mother's willing to be responsible? When you show up for school the first time, should it actually be a room where you might learn? Does that matter? I mean, these are, by the time you start thinking through how the system works and how today we coerce people into monopolies that fail, you will live in public housing. You will go to the public school. You will be on streets that are unsafe. Gee, we're really sorry, but after all, life's hard. You know, there's a huge, huge change from here to here. This is, again, one of the things we keep kidding ourselves about. If you truly want healthy inner cities, if you truly want healthy Indian reservations, and you truly want healthy West Virginia, Appalachian, poor neighborhoods, you're talking about a big change. This is not a small change. This is one of the largest changes in American history. And we just don't take it seriously. We pay lip service to it, and then we say, and then we walk off, and then the kid gets killed. And then we say, gee, that's sad. And what I'm suggesting is, if we take that child seriously as an American, and we take the Declaration seriously as a document and the Constitution, and then we decide in our generation we're fed up with it, and we're going to actually shoulder the responsibility as a country, all of us, including the poor, of making the transition, we're taking on a big challenge, maybe in some ways as big as the Cold War. It's not going to be a small thing, and it's not going to happen overnight. Now, I think that to understand our strategies of replacement, we must revisit the five pillars of American civilization. We have to look at the historic lessons of American civilization. We have to look at personal strength, at entrepreneurial free enterprise, at the spirit of invention and discovery, and at quality as defined by Edwards Deming. Now, I can give this lecture this time totally different, or not, but dramatically different, I won't say totally, say 60% different than a year ago because of the help of several people. And the first one I want to thank is Marvin Olasky. This is The Tragedy of American Compassion. Uh, it is the book which, frankly, for me, unlocked the key to how to do this. And I think it is one of the most extraordinary books uh, written in our generation. Olasky went back, and, and you'll understand my bias in a second. I mean, and by the way, I want to thank Marvin Olasky because he helped write this, this uh, today's session. And was very generous in giving his time and in outlining how he, how he would approach it. What he did, and this, this fits my bias as a history teacher, he went back and looked at 350 years of how Americans dealt with poverty, tragedy, and addiction with much greater success than the current welfare state. When you begin to read his book, uh, those of you who are not used to reading lots of history, you're going, why does he have me in the founding of the colonies? And why does he start here at the very beginning with uh, Jamestown and, and with uh, the, the, uh, the early American model of compassion? Now, when he says early American model uh, on page 6, he's talking about uh, Plymouth in 1620. I mean, he's really going back and you kind of going, why am I reading this? talks about Fairfield, Connecticut in 1673. 
But what he shows you chapter by chapter is a consistency about how Americans thought about poverty and how they thought about helping the poor that is astonishing. What the traditional reformers warned against is precisely what the welfare state did. And when you read Olasky, you realize that based on American history, the welfare state is virtually a design for guaranteed failure. I mean, I found, I read this over Christmas at my mother-in-law's, and I found myself so startled by the warnings. Let me give you an example. Mary Richmond of the Baltimore Charity Organizing Society summed up in 1897 the wisdom of a century of work. Quote, now I want you to think about this in terms of the system your taxes pay for today. <coughs> Quote, relief given without reference to friends and neighbors is accompanied by moral loss. Poor neighborhoods are doomed to grow poorer whenever the natural ties of neighborliness are weakened by well-meant but unintelligent interference. Let me go back to the, the, the key sentence. Relief given without reference to friends and neighbors is accompanied by moral loss. Now, what is the very definition of AFDC, food stamps, et cetera? An anonymous person walks into an anonymous office to deal with an anonymous bureaucrat to have an anonymous transaction. Right? You have the faceless poor and the faceless bureaucrat engage in a faceless interaction. That By con lack of accountability on their part. Right. Totally. But it also leads to, to a depersonalization that's devastating. Here's what the magazine American Hebrew in 1898 wrote about how one man was sunk into dependency, but a volunteer, quote, with great patience, convinced him that he must earn, earn his living, soon he did, and regained the respect of his family and community. A woman had become demoralized, but, quote, for months she was worked with, now through kindness, again through discipline, until finally she began to show a desire to help herself, close quote. I mean, imagine the average caseworker with 200 families on their caseload trying to deal with this kind of intense relationship. Uh, they go a stage further. Quote, intelligent giving, this is the New Orleans Charity Organization Society of 1899. Intelligent giving and intelligent withholding are alike true charity. Now imagine saying to your local welfare office, intelligent giving and intelligent withholding are alike true charity. Or saying at the same time, Quote, if drink has made a man poor, money will feed not him, but his drunkenness. We send supplemental security, just think about it, we send supplemental security insurance checks to alcoholics and addicts. And let me repeat the quote from the New Orleans Charity Organization, 18. If, drunk, if drink has made a man poor, money will feed not him, but his drunkenness. Poverty fighters a century ago trained volunteers to leave behind, quote, a conventional attitude toward the poor, seeing them through the comfortable haze of our own intentions. And one of the things that comes through the Alaska book again and again is there are many poor people who will game the system. When you let them game the system, you are helping them destroy themselves. You have an obligation to love them enough to be firm with them, not just to love them enough to give. 